American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my hand tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down like blues on two. Episode 108 of American Timelines coming to you right now. Welcome to another episode of American Timelines. I'm Amy, and that's Joe. And what? Yes, and we're married. We fell in love a long time ago, and now we do a podcast together. And we are going to discuss 1968 today. That's right. We're in a new year. We only got two more years left in the 60s, y'all, before we're into a new season. That's right. This We're winding down season four. Mm-hmm. It's going to get crazy. 68 and 69 were crazy. Yes. And already 67 was crazy. What, we had nine episodes or something in that yes, year? But but I just mean with things that were bananas. That World-changing things are happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and in case you missed our last bunch of episodes, we the American Timelines here, I would say we are solely responsible for uncovering uh, the fact that 1967 was full of bus cra- bus mm-hmm. buses falling off cliffs. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of buses. A lot of buses in the 60s fell off cliffs, I filled with why. people. And we'll see. Does that trend continue in 1968? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Am teaser. I foreshadowing? Maybe. A little tickler. But as we do every time we start a new year, we got some things that don't really have a date, but yes. happened in 68. Okay. So I'll tell you those things. Great. First of all. Uh, the Harlem Globetrotters were formed in 1968, and they were formed in Chicago. Okay. And, you know, they didn't play a game of basketball in Harlem until 1968. No, they were formed before this. Oh. But, yeah, actually 40 years before this. So, so 1948? Why are you bringing it up? No, they didn't play in Harlem until 1968. Oh, okay, I see. And they're supposed to be the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. They're, they came out in the 40s or something, finally in 68. And I looked up, I kind of looked a lot. I looked to she see what day it was. I didn't like look it. a lot. Also, uh, the cost of a Super Bowl ad in 1968 was mm. only $54,000. Wow, that's a difference. Are you upset I didn't make you a guess? No, I'm so glad. Um, I'm happy about that. There were four mysterious submarine disappearances in 1968. Oh, I think I ran across that. Yeah, the USS Scorpion, uh, an Israeli submarine, the INS Dakar, a French submarine, Wait, no. The USS Scorpion, the Israeli submarine, the INS Dakar, the French submarine Minerve, and the Soviet submarine K-129 all went down and disappeared. And disappeared. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Somebody needs submarines. Mothman, maybe. Yeah. He's driving them around. Um, uh, 1968 was when we heard the slogans ring around the collar. Oh, yeah. From Whisk. Yep. You've got a long way, baby. Mm-hmm. Virginia, Virginia Slims. Virginia Slims. Yep. Uh, minimum wage in 1968 was a dollar oh per hour. Holy shit! Don't you sometimes wish you could go back in time with the money that you have now? Oh yeah. And um, just my salary now, I'd be a, I'd be, be a, a super rich guy. Yeah, I know. Wouldn't that be something? Of course, we wouldn't have any technology. And I'm and nothing stuff. here. Yeah, and you couldn't. Yeah, I don't think I could live without the technology. You could live. You'd be surprised at what you could live without. No, I'm telling you. Just the other day, I went to the bathroom to go number two. Oh, we don't need to know. No, no, and I forgot my phone. So what'd you do? It was the worst experience. I was like, "What? I don't know what to do with myself. I can't, I'm alone with my thoughts while I'm pooping. Oh, hurry up, poop!" And the poop wasn't coming very All fast. Right. We're, this is this conversation's going nowhere. There's just nothing to do. You have to have your phone when you poop. I couldn't believe it. All right, and Let's then move I, it on. dawned on me that I hadn't pooped without a phone, and I don't know how long. Let's move on. Uh, also, in 1968, the U.S. patent for lava lamps was permitted. Oh yeah. Had a lot of those. Uh, in 1968, uh, uh, Mattel made a toy called the Toot Toot Sweet that shaped Tootsie Rolls candy into actual working whistles. Did you know that? What? I don't know. The top song, the top uh, TV shows in 1968 were Rowan and Martin's Laughing. Mm-hmm. Number one, Gomer mm-hmm. Pyle. Number two. Yes. Bonanza. Number three. Mm-hmm. 
Mayberry RFD was four. I wonder what that... That must be a spinoff. It had to be a spinoff. I think Mayberry something fire department. Oh, maybe. What's R? Rescue fire department, maybe. I don't know. I didn't know that existed. We'll have to look that up. And number five was Family Affair. Okay. Um, Operation Wandering Soul Mm -hmm. took place in Vietnam in 1968. Did you ever hear this? No. They... uh, Recordings of Americans pretending to be ghosts, urging the Viet Cong to turn back or give up, oh were played God. throughout the forest at night. I wonder if that worked at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's a desperate move, isn't it? Yeah. It. Well, the operation played off the belief of many Vietnamese people, and they all believe yeah. in this wandering soul thing. So yeah. So it, they thought that would kind of smart if you think about it. Yeah. I don't know if it worked or not. I don't think. Well, but, we lost the war, so. Well, nobody won, really. Nobody wins in war, do they? No, but the Viet, but the the communists took over, so yeah, we lost according to what we were set out to do. I don't know. I'm I'm watching Ken Burns Vietnam to really try mm-hmm. to understand it more. Uh, by the time I finish, it'll be too late to mm-hmm. help on this podcast, probably. But um, yeah, I think that covers most of the. Oh, another thing, uh, Roy Jacuzzi. Invented a new type of whirlpool bath. Yes, he did. What do you think it was called? Yes, he, he had a lot of chest hair and a lot of gold chains around his neck, I uh, bet you. Uh, yeah, you think that's your, just a guess? Yep. Well, I don't know if you know this, but there is controversy between mm-hmm. Roy Jacuzzi and his uncle as to who really invented it. They need a special pube filter in a jacuzzi. Well, it's either... Candido Jacuzzi or Roy Jacuzzi? Roy Jacuzzi gets all the credit, but a lot of people think Candido Jacuzzi really did it. Are they their brothers? But they both have, no, uncle and nephew. Oh, I got They you. both have a lot of chest hair, probably. Mm-hmm. But there is, I think. There I are, think who, the winner needs to be who has the most. Whoever whoever can fill a Jacuzzi most with pubes. And chest hair. Yeah. They That's, each get in a Jacuzzi for a week, mm-hmm. and then you measure it in pubes yeah. and chest hair. Yeah, that's, that's the That's a good idea. That's not a bad idea. And then <laughs> um, going into the year, the Beatles' Hello, Goodbye was the number one song on the Billboard chart. That's a good one. It was. Uh, can you sing a little bit of it? Um, I, I, I say goodbye and you say hello. Hello, mm. hello. hello. I don't know why you say goodbye. I say hello. Good work. Thanks. And then Tuesday, January 2nd, the day after New Year's, American film actor who won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in Jerry Maguire in Bronx, New York. Cuba Gooding Jr. was born. He came into the world. Okay. And I know you hate birthdays, but Saturday, January 6th, 1968, the collision of an express train and a truck stalled on the tracks killed 13 people in England, all of them passengers on the train. The truck driver and his co-workers were uninjured. Wow. You would think that would be the other way around. Yeah. Uh at Hickson, a village in Staffordshire, mm-hmm. the truck was slowly hauling a 125-ton electrical transform over the crossing when the Manchester to London southbound express train arrived with 500 people on board. The crossing gates lowered automatically, preventing the truck from completing its move off the crossing, and the locomotive and eight cars derailed. Bummer. I wonder why the truck was fine, but the People on the train all died. That's kind of bizarre. I have no idea. Maybe it was just the back of the truck or something. It could be. Saturday, January 7th, 1968, 43 passengers on a bus in South Korea were killed oh near Jinju God. when their bus lost one of its front wheels, went out of control, and fell over a 33-foot-high cliff and sank in the Nam River. I'm beginning to think they they need some safety checks on some of these buses. Yeah, especially if they're over like, mountains. Check the equipment. Make sure everything's on tight. I think if we had Twitter or something... Mm-hmm. The news would spread so fast, you would never get on another bus on a yeah, cliff. Yeah, probably. Cliffs. Uh, that same day, the Los Angeles Times reported a group of over 200 Caltech students marched to and demonstrated in front of NBC Studios in Burbank as part of what appeared to be a grassroots campaign actually orchestrated by Gene Roddenberry to get the network to renew Star Trek for a third season. <laughs> This, so people were marching for stupid shit back then, too. Yeah, there was a lot of great stuff, but then there was a stupid-ass Star Trek stuff. I'm also a Trekkie. Yeah. Yes, I want civil rights, but also live wrong and prosper. Yeah. I, I want Star Trek to be on a TV still. Yeah. Sometimes you got to have shows for those nerds. Mm-hmm. And then Friday, January 12th, 1968. Mm-hmm. 
The American Telephone and Telegraph Company, which controlled all but a few of the telephones in the U.S., announced plans to provide a universal emergency telephone number that could be dialed quickly from any mm. telephone in the country. 911. Yep. And that came um, That's off the heels of again. that. Remember that murder of the girl? Um, God, what was her name? Yeah, in New York, that, where everybody saw it and nobody called, and that, that helped spur 911. Wow. In New York, at least, like it's. Did we cover there. that? You mm-hmm. covered it, right? Yep. I remember you saying that at one point. Kit, Kitty Genovese, that's the name. That's her name. Oh, I remember that one. Uh, anyway, there's. I have a whole bunch of stuff about that, but how interesting could that be? Yeah. Saturday, January thirteenth, nineteen sixty-eight. Bill Masterson, a center for the Minnesota North Stars of the National Hockey League. Now they're not in Minnesota anymore. They're in Dallas. Are they still uh, called the North Stars? They're called the Stars. They okay, that's the North better. Part. Uh, anyway, Bill Masterson was fatally injured during a game against the Oakland Seals Ooh. when he received a body check by two defenders while skating toward the Oakland goal with the puck. The incident happened in the early minutes of the game in front of a crowd of 12,119 spectators. After Master- Masterson was taken from the rink and blood cleaned from the ice, play continued in a game that would end in a 2-2 two two tie. Masterson, who was known for scoring the North Star's very first goal when the team began play on October 11, 1967, would die 30 hours later from brain hemorrhaging caused by severe head trauma. So checking is just like bunching, is it's just like, like body, body slamming. Yeah, like body how did that cause him to die? Well, severe trauma, hemorrhaging caused by severe head trauma. Apparently, they, I'm guessing they hit him. He must like have two hit people his head might have hit him, somehow. and maybe he hit his head on the ice. Hmm. Yeah. And the blood. I wonder where the blood's coming from. Well, you get hit by two dudes. Yeah. And I don't even know. They might not have even wore helmets then. Yeah, they probably didn't. Yeah. So, yep. That same day, mm-hmm. while that dude was dying from hockey. Johnny Cash performed his historic concert at the Folsom State Prison Mm -hmm. in California, selected by his manager because of Cash's 1955 hit song. A Man Named Sue? No, Folsom Prison Blues. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There was a man named Sue there. Yeah. The concert was the first that Cash had performed at a penal institution. You said penal. Not penial. Penal. Penile. No. Penal institution, penal. Nor was Cash the only artist to appear that day. The Statler brothers, Carl Perkins, the Carter family, and the Tennessee Three were also present. But it was the first time that Cash had recorded a live album inside a prison. You don't. People don't do that anymore. They don't record live albums inside prisons. Yeah, you don't yeah. have a lot of c- celebrities going out and entertaining the prisoners. At least you don't hear about it. Mm-mm. Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison would become the number one country music album in the United States after going on sale in May. That's a good. There's good songs on that. Yep. And then on January 14th, 1968, mm-hmm. uh, while LL Cool J was being born as James Todd Smith in Bayshore, New York, the Green Bay Packers defeated the Oakland Raiders 33-14 to in Super Bowl II mm-hmm. before 75,546 fans at the Orange Bowl in Miami. And then Vince Lombardi retired as the Packers head coach after the event, which was still referred to officially as the AFL-NFL World Championship Game. And LL Cool J is bad. I don't know what any of that means. He's too bad for you, understand? Okay, let's move on. Thursday, January 18th, 1968. Mm Mm-hmm. Singer and actress Eartha Kitt. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar? Mm-hmm. She was a guest at the White House oh. at a luncheon hosted by Lady Bird Johnson to honor a group of women doers. Women doers? Yep. Influential women. Okay. Uh, to talk about specific issues. When President Johnson entered the dining room, Kitt asked him what appeared to be a routine question about delinquent parents, and she didn't like the answer she'd been given. Um. Uh, Although Kit didn't vent her anger on the president himself, her confrontation with the first lady about the Vietnam War became an embarrassing incident. What was her question? I don't know. This, this is what I have from Wikipedia. Oh, this is what okay. Wikipedia says. Okay. Oh, so this is what she said. I have a baby, and then you send him off to war, Kit reportedly said. No wonder the kids rebel and take pot. And Mrs. Johnson, in case you don't understand the lingo, that's marijuana. Afterward, Kit would experience a slow decline in her career. Oh. 
Two days later, in a telephone call, Chicago Mayor Richard Daley expressed his support for Lady Bird and revealed that a 500-strong women's group in Chicago had declared their support for Lady Bird in the incident, including a lady whose 20-year-old son had recently died in Nam. Hanoi immediately used Kit's outbursts for their own propaganda purposes. Mm. And meanwhile, while that mm-hmm. uncomfortableness was going on at the White House, the first Red Lobster seafood restaurant was opened. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Thank God that started. What state do you think it opened in? I'm going to say... Red Lobster. Maine. Where does that belong? Maine? Florida. Yeah. Florida. Lakeland, Florida. Yeah. East Memorial Boulevard. Yeah. Are you familiar? No. Um, then, on Friday, January 19th, 1968, Operation Cross Tie. Mm-hmm. Project Faultless was an experiment that took place to see if an earthquake could be triggered by detonating an underground nuclear weapon along the fault line. Hmm. After the residents of the closest towns to the central Nevada test site, Tonopah and Eureka, Nevada, were briefed about what to expect, an atomic bomb was detonated detonated in Nye County at a depth of 3,200 feet. Mm -hmm. The blast, described by the Atomic Energy Commission as being one megaton, was believed to be the most powerful nuclear weapon ever exploded in the U.S. and caused upheavals and dropping of the ground in a wide area, breaking windows 87 miles away at a high school in Eli. Because of the surface damage, the test site would eventually be declared unsuitable. Yeah. According to reports the next day, buildings swayed in Salt Lake City and San Francisco, particularly in the Southern Pacific Building in the California City. The tremor caused by the blast was estimated by the University of California, Berkeley, to be a 6.0 on the Richter scale. Jeez, why do they have to do that? I guess they have to tell, make sure they work or something? So I guess they them. wanted to test if they could create earthquakes. I don't know why they wanted to test that. <sighs> Meanwhile, U.S. President... Well, they did it underground so that... There's like in their ideas that it's not going to hurt anything if it's way under yeah. the ground, but it it's does. Hurt still does. Ants, yeah, and voles. Mm-hmm. That, that same day, during that, uh, U.S. President Johnson completed the installation of a tape recording system in the cabinet room of the White House to preserve his discussions of meetings with the leaders of government departments. Mm. Good thing he he installed that because that's how we got the whole Nixon thing. Yeah, that's right. And on Saturday, January 20th, 1968, John Fred and his Playboy band take over the number one spot in the Billboard charts with Judy in Disguise with glasses. Judy in Disguise no, with no. glasses. That's not right. It's not? Mm-mm. How does it go? You're not singing. It's, I don't know what you're talking about. Judy in Disguise with glasses. John Fred and his Playboy band. I don't know that one. I bet it's Judy in Disguise no, with glasses. Don't you think it's like a parody? No. Judy in disguise. You see the guy singing it looks like uh, Bentley from the Jeffersons. Judy in disguise. <laughs> there, now you know it. Like a British white guy? Yeah, with a yellow shirt on. And then Wednesday, January 24th, 1968, Mary Lou Retton, American gymnast and 1984 Olympic gold medalist, was born in Fairmont, West Virginia, and she changed the world with her greatness the moment she came into the world. We were now in a world with Mary Lou Retton. Okay. Uh, and then Friday, that brings us to Friday, January 26th. Yes. And I understand that my beautiful better half, yes. my buxom blonde bombshell of a wife, Quit has, yelling. has something for us. I feel like you're yelling at me. On that day. And are we... um, you know how the last couple episodes have been... Of American Timelines by History for Jerks? Yes. Have been, um, how should we say, rape-free. Yes, and that's I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback from our listeners, and yes. they prefer that, and they're happy about that. I don't think that's true. And they true. said, "Please, no more rape." Oh, you think we have a lot of rape fans that are really no? I just out? I don't think anybody contacted you one way or the, one way or the other about it. Uh, are you calling me a liar? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, unfortunately, I have to make up for all that time today. And you don't have to. Well, it's not. So we're gonna do a whole. It's not rape, really rape. Rape heavy episode when they're dead already. It's not really rape. Oh, well, let's see. It's defiling a corpse. That's true. They can't consent. But they're not alive anymore. So it's it's defiling a corpse. I guess as a teenage boy, you rape a sock. If you look at it that way, it's not necessarily a lot of rape. But I just want you to buckle up is what I'm trying to say. 
So there's a lot of necrophilia here. There's 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 a lot of stuff. So I'm going to talk about the shoe fetish slayer Jerry Brudos today. Okay. So people that have a fetish, just saying a fetish. I don't know, like a foot, like people like feet and shoes and like there are people that are got problems. Okay. The younger of two brothers, Jerome Henry Brudos was born on January 31st, 1939. Oh, wait a minute. He was born on January 31st, 1939, the same day mm-hmm. that George Burns was fined $8,000 for jewelry smuggling in addition to the $9,770, nine, almost 10000 he already paid in duties and penalties. He also was sentenced to a year and a day in prison, but that sentence was suspended that same day. George Burns? George Burns. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Criminal. Uh, he, so he was born in Webster, South Dakota. Okay. His childhood was dominated by his cruel and highly critical mother. And that is a theme we've heard before. Yes. Uh, parenting, those of you who are thinking about becoming parents or have become parents, mm-hmm. it's important what you do. Yeah. You can make a killer and dead shoe rapist. Well, because he had an l- older brother named Larry. Oh, that he, also is a problem. And La- Never yes. have an older brother named Larry. Larry was the apple of mom's eye. So anybody named Larry she, always is. When she was going to have her, Jerry, she um, wanted a girl, and so when oh, he when came Jerry out, was born, boy, it, he wasn't a girl. She was disappointed. She was. But Larry, on the other hand, and anybody you've ever known named Larry, they are always the apple of eye of everyone. Everybody loves Larry. Mm. Larry this, Larry that. I love Larry. All Larry, right. Larry, Larry. So then his father was very short-tempered. Okay. And the family was poor, and they moved frequently. Boy, they got everything up against him. Yep. This guy's got everything going against him. There, his father would take on casual jobs wherever he could find, and they finally ended up in Corvallis, Oregon. Okay. While his mother lavished all her attention and love on Larry... Jerry was left on to his own devices, and he would just roam around the neighborhood freely. Get out of here, Jerry! I just want to look at Larry all day. Yep. Oh, Larry. So on Go one, have sex with a shoe, Jerry. On one of these outings, he would go to the junkyard and play. Yeah. And <laughs> I um, would probably do that, too. Yeah, if you had nothing else to there do. There was a junkyard nearby? That's he, where I'm making a beeline. He came line. across a pair of patent leather high-heeled shoes. Uh-oh. And he brought them home. And Mom got pissed. Uh-oh. So she told him to take him back to the dump. Jerry, I'm trying to look at Larry. Stop bringing home these shoes. Take him back to the dump. I want to look at Larry some more. Mm-hmm. But he didn't take him back like she told him to. He hit him in his he room. He was like, F that noise. I want these. Mm-hmm. And she soon found him again. Uh-oh. And then she burned him. Oh. And that was she the punished next... him very severely for having the shoes. Okay. I understand the burning, and I understand you got to get tough when somebody doesn't take shoes back to the dump. Mm-hmm. You gotta get tough. Well, he, his shoe fetish had begun be- yeah. because of this, and it would rule the rest of his life. And maybe if she had just let him do what he wanted with those shoes, he would have got it, worked it himself out of it. Mm-hmm. And as an awkward, freckled teenager, he would sneak out at night to steal women's clothes from washing lines and steal their shoes. Um, hmm, he even stole weird. a pair of his teacher's high-heeled shoes from under her desk. Yeah, once it's there's a thing about this. For and sure. he removed a pair from a sleeping teenage girl. Well, she shouldn't have been sleeping with her shoes on. But he was caught and humiliated on both occasions. Oh. But he got very aroused from the whole thing. Uh, and um, From not being humiliated. But no, from, from the, just the, shoes. the shoes. I don't get that. That makes no sense to me. So Jerry did not do well in school. Well, how could you? He was described as a dull and sickly kid. Who suffered from childhood illnesses and severe migraines. Dull and sickly? Yes. Okay. He had a normal IQ, but had to repeat second grade. At age 16, Jerry had his first wet dream. Oh, wait. Oh, geez. Ugh. But instead of explaining that it was normal, he was punished by his mother. He was punished for having it, which he couldn't help. And then, wait, did he repeat the second grade just because he was dull and sickly? No. Sorry, all dull, sickly kids. Got to take it again. No, he just, he Be just less dull. didn't do well. Oh, okay. So at this age, he started to develop violent fantasies towards women. Ugh. He even dug a tunnel in the hillside near his home, and yeah. he wanted to lure a girl there and attack her. Uh, he that's... later explained that although he didn't know yet much about sex or rape, the idea of possessing a female excited him. Uh, ugh. And he his collection of women's clothing and shoes throughout his life, it, he would take it with him 
for, so, de- for decades. So he's got a wardrobe. He's got a yes. wardrobe now. Yes. He's he's got a an array of mm-hmm. uh, maybe impressive so gowns. He's, so he's seventeen now. Shoes covered in acne. He's fat. He's redheaded. Clumsy. Very shy. Sounds like your type. Yeah, the looker. <laughs> He was gi- he was big dude too. Oh, big, heavy, big, acne heavy. covered, freckled, freckled, red hair. Red hair is the worst. <laughs> I know that's what I'm making it sound like. Um, that's not what I mean. So he broke into a girl's house and stole her underwear. Then he came around and knocked on her door and said that he was an undercover agent sent to investigate a panty thief in the neighbor- neighborhood. And the reason he was only 17 is because that way nobody would know that he was, um, that his cover wouldn't be blown because nobody would think a 17-year-old. Can you imagine if that description of a guy showed up to your door saying that? I know. So he told her he needed her to come to his house um, where no one was home to discuss the case further because if anyone saw them together, he would have his cover blown. Yes, that's, that so, makes sense. And, she, and he convinced her? Well, she, did she, she thought he was harmless and she thought it was kind of a, like she was bored and she just thought out of, just to okay, I'll, Let's co- see I'll what go. what happens. Yeah. And um, when she knocked on the door and went into his house, he called from upstairs. He was upstairs. And yeah. He called her. Come oh, so on he, up. He, so he came to her house later. He, he, said, he came to her house later. and then he went home and he said, yeah. "You need to come to my house at yeah. some point." Right. So and then so she, she does. Later. Yeah. And he's upstairs and he says, "Come on, come on up." Oh my God! And he's so when she what is he doing? Is he she gets up com- there? Is he on a toilet? Is he completely naked? He's he's wearing a he jumps out shoe of a closet yeah. wearing a mask. Okay, and he gets a knife. You know what kind of a mask? Can we describe the mask? I don't have it. What are you picturing in your mind? Like a Lone Ranger mask or a clown mask? Probably or a, like a leather face type. I don't know. I don't probably know. like a Lone Ranger over the yeah. eyes. Yeah. Like so, um, he jumped out of the closet. He's got a mask and a knife. He ordered her to take off all her clothes, uh, and when he she did, he took an entire film roll's worth of pictures. Uh, then he ran out of the room, and then, thinking that he was clever, he ran back in without the mask, and he was all fake heavy breathing, and he told her that someone with the mask had knocked, had locked him in the barn. Uh, Is she okay? And she knew he was lying, but she didn't report it because she was so scared of him, and she didn't know what was going to happen next. Because he's bizarre. He's, biz- he's bizarre. So a year later, he in 1956, we're at now, he lured a girl into his car. And when she refused to remove her clothes, he began to beat her up. And, but then she was saved by a passing couple. So they come driving by and they yeah. see what's going on. And, oh they, and then he tries to say he was passing by and saw her being attacked. And and they didn't believe that. Yeah. And then he said that um, that he was saving her from from somebody from else somebody else and they didn't so they they um had him they made him and her go to their house and they called the police yeah and the police show up now and the and yes and so he was classified as a juvenile offender so oh, they yeah, went, because still... they went to his house and they found one of the stashes of his panties and the some of the pictures uh. so they classified him as a juvenile offender and sent him to Oregon State Hospital for psychiatric evaluation. Okay. Where, where doctors said there that they saw no evidence of violent tendencies or mental illness. What? But they diagnosed him as suffering from, quote, adjustment reaction of adolescence with sexual deviation fetishism. Well, yeah, I guess. Ugh. So he was. Treat- there must have been some criteria mm-hmm. then to classify someone as, as a. Violent. Offender or violent. Or well, and keep in something- mind that there's no such thing yet as serial. I mean, they're. There are serial killers, but they don't. They have not created that. Well, he didn't do. He didn't hurt anybody yet. Not right? yet. Not yet. Like he was about to. It seemed like. Yes. But he didn't. Right. So he was treated in that the. That sucks. Me- that you have to actually hurt somebody to I be know. caught. Okay. So he was treated in the mental ward for nine months. Okay. And he would attend school during the day, and he did show some talent in math and science. Oh, good. But but then the treatment was probably crazy. It's probably like they probably shock shocked or him and yeah. stuff and whatever else. After his release, he went back to live at home. He would eventually graduate in 1958. A year later, after that, he enlisted in the Army. All right. Where he trained as a communications technician, but they found him unfit for service and discharged him six months later. Unfit for service? Surprise, surprise. He then moved back home to Oregon and continued to increase his collection of stolen underwear. 
It was at this time he began to stalk women. He would oh. knock them down and he would run away with their shoes. Oh. And he would sleep with the shoes. Not sleep with, but you mean. I think all of the above. You think he would take a nap with them, but yeah. also put his wiener in yeah. it? Yeah. All right. So despite all this, Jerry met and married a shy. Make love to a shoe? Yeah. Is it love making? I don't know. He met and married a shy 17-year-old named Darcy. Wait a minute. He married? Yeah, he met and married. Yes. He met and married they a woman? They knew each other for six weeks, and he got her pregnant, and so then they... She slept with this guy? Yeah. This yeah. mound of acne-covered, yep. red-haired... Mm-hmm. He was at this point not, probably not acne covered anymore. Oh, maybe the acne went away. Yeah. Maybe he lost some poundage. Maybe he dyed his hair. <laughs> no. I God knows think. nobody would marry a red haired oh, person. Oh, my goodness. Then they had a second child and settled in Portland where he got a job as an electrician. So they're in Portland. He's an electrician. He's got two kids somehow. Two kids. Well, and before Don't you they... think the people, the single people who are looking for partners of the world are I like, know. how's this guy? I know. Well, and he was get it. Like at first, everything was fine in the marriage, but then he had this real active sex life. Like he wanted her to like do the housework in the nude and stuff. And well, I, well, ride around in their daughter's tricycle with a, without any clothes on. And well, so far, you. I don't oh, see anything wrong so with either one of those two things. No, I'm just kidding. Those are weird. So the tricycle's probably weird because it's real small, and it's just, they're child's. Yeah, that's gross. Weird. Well, there's good naked, and but bad she naked. was unaware at this point of his mental problems and fetishes. She didn't know anything about. She him. didn't know that. She didn't know he had a collection of no women's. He hid it from her. Wow, he's pretty smart. Um. So soon after about three years or so, she starts to notice a change in Jerry's behavior. You know who I'm picturing is Jerry now. Mm. Now, I was picturing a different person, but now that he's grown up and beautiful, I'm picturing Donnie Most from Happy Days. No, I, I would say he's heavy. more, I believe you have my stapler. Oh, you think he looks like that he guy? He looks more, he does look more like that How guy. did he find this lady then? I don't know. I believe you have my stapler. Have you seen pictures of him? Yes. Oh, okay. He was, um, they portrayed him on Mindhunter too, that show. What's that? Mindhunter's that show about how the FBI started profiling criminal profiling and it's the true story about oh. how they started what's this guy's last name brudos b-r-u-d-o-s oh came right up yeah oh well he's, uh, i don't think he looks like the you know uh, my stapler guy i think he's a good looking man are you kidding he's not gross he's I'd, pretty gross i'd hook up with him <laughs> all right so anyway anyway no i wouldn't so um, so jerry started becoming very depressed and he started having migraines again. Okay. He also struggled to hold... Wait, migraine. He had migraines before? When, remember when he was a kid? Oh, yeah. He also struggled to hold down a job, and it caused them to move 20 times in their seven-year marriage. Hmm. She also... 20 times? Yeah. She was also disturbed by their increasingly bizarre sexual demands that she no longer found enjoyable. But she did at one point. Well, they were getting increasingly bizarre. Yeah. So as Darcy began rejecting Jerry, he turned to murder. Well, you know what? If your wife starts rejecting weird, odd things, you have to. You have no choice but to kill people. Well, and it, it, although murder was never part of his like fantasies before he had killed, yeah, he had later admitted that he had long, long held yearnings to preserve female corpses so he could dress them in his favorite lingerie and pose them. You know, you could just get a mannequin. I know. Then you don't have to hurt anybody. Yeah. Um, so it for him, Maybe it, nobody wasn't, told him that. it wasn't about the kill. Yeah. It was about the body, which is the difference between yeah. a process killer and a product killer. They have, they categorize. This is a product killer? This is a product killer, yeah. Because they, they want a body. It's like Jeffrey Dahmer. Huh. Yeah. A process killer is the one who's in it for Enjoys the kill. Enjoys the action of Like killing. Richard Ramirez. That, I, can't, I can't believe people have... Like, looked into this so much to have. Well, they have to because they need they yeah. need to be able to catch them. Yeah, I guess so they you're need right. the north. They need to know all about it as much as they can know about it. All right. So the first murder, the first murder, y'all dig in. Outwardly murder ordinary twenty eight year old family man committed on January twenty sixth, nineteen sixty eight, which is where we are now. January twenty sixth, nineteen sixty eight. Oh, the same day that on the wild wild west. Are you familiar with that show? No. 
Jim and Artie unknowingly became a part of a bizarre revenge plot involving mistaken identities. Wild Wild West was about two Secret Service agents equipped with a wide array of gizmos who work for the government in the Old West, starring Robert Conrad, Ross okay. Martin, and Dick Kenji. Do you know who Robert Conrad is? No. Oh. All right. So the victim was um, Linda Slauson, age 19. Oh. She was the sales girl. She was in the neighborhood selling encyclopedias. Oh, you know... Her parents thought, what a nice lady motivated to get a job and sell some encyclopedias. What's the worst that could happen? Right. And so she... Murder. It was raining and she had the address on written on a piece of paper, but the rain had smudged the address so she didn't know where she was supposed to go. So she so went she to the wrong house. So she saw Jerry was in his yard and she came up and he started chatting her up. And oh, then when no. She what was he said, doing in his yard, do you think? Like kung fu moves? Maybe. And a so jock strap. He acted like he knew exactly what she was talking about and uh, like, oh yeah, 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 the encyclopedias. Come on in. Oh no. And so, um Now his, think about it. That's and, something that'll never happen again. Nobody will do door to door encyclopedia sales ever again. That's true. And his family is upstairs in the house. He oh. invites her to the basement. While his family's upstairs? Yes. Oh, snap. Even Larry? Mm -hmm. Larry was home? Yeah, I think. Oh, no. Larry's his brother. Brother. This is would be his, his yeah, new this family. Is his, this is his, his But his mom was his there. Wife. Oh. To watching the kids. She was watching the kids even though she only likes Larry? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, with uh, he he beat her into unconsciousness and strangled her. Oh. No, no I understand why you guys like this stuff. Then he abused and raped the corpse, dre <sighs> dressed it with clothes from his collection, and photographed. Come on, man. It. Finally, he Ugh. chopped off the left foot and with a newly fitted shoe, put it in his refrigerator. Oh, okay. Great. Wonderful. That seems normal. Um, so finally, oh, we already said that. We might have to wait. So his mother was upstairs babysitting and psychiatrists had speculated that his final act of cutting off the foot was because of memories of how mad she was when he came home from the dump with that shoe that one day. So that made him want to cut off a foot and, and put it in it a and shoe hide it. and hide it? Yeah. So after he killed her, he bound the body to an old car engine block and threw it in the Willamette River. Oh, That's how okay. he disposed of her. Well, that, that'll do it. So his garage started becoming this, sent, this command... Let's start that over. His garage started becoming this, like, command center for him. Okay. He would not let uh, Darcy come down in the garage. She had to call him on the intercom if she needed anything. Oh, she intercom. wasn't allowed to go in there. He said that he was. He had a dark room, is what he told her, in the garage. <sighs> okay. And he was. And he did take a lot of pictures, but that if she were to come down without he, him knowing, she He'd could be real mad. ruin the pictures or whatever. Well, you know what? That's a, not a bad idea. So I'd like you to stay out of our garage. And she was also required to call home if she was out and she yeah. was on her. She's getting ready to come home. She, she had to call him she first. Had to call him first. Actually, that's not a bad idea too. Could you start doing that? There's some red. Can we say red flags? Red flags. Red flags, flags starting to fly. Red here. flags. All right. Then on November twenty sixth, nineteen sixty eight. Yes. Are you talking about what you're about to tell me happened the same day that? Louis D. Saperstein, 63, American insurance broker who came into disfavor with the Genovese crime family after stopping his interest payments of $5,000 a week. The American mafia died of poisoning a day after writing a letter to the FBI describing threats on his life by the family hitman Angelo DiCarlo. Yes. That same day? Yes. Wow. He, um, Brutus was driving and he saw 23 year old Jan Whitney standing beside her broken down car. Poor Jan Whitney. If her car just hadn't, if she just had gotten the oil changed. And, and so he she'd be says, alive today. He says, Oh, I, I can help you, but I need to go get my toolbox from yeah. the house. It's, so why don't you come with me? It's filled with feet and shoes and yep. dildos. So he, she goes with him to his house. Oh, no. He strangled she her. never came back. Yep. He defiles the corpse again and dresses Ugh. the body and photographs it again. <sighs> um, he left it hanging on a hook in his locked garage for five days. Her body? Yes. Returning to abuse it again and again. Oh. Uh... Yeah. His final savage act 
was to amputate one of her breasts, which he kept as a paperweight. He filled it with sawdust. And he... Um, Does that work? You can do that? It didn't work. It didn't turn out too great. Oh. His wife actually found it. He found a tit? Hey, whose tit is yeah. this? <laughs> is this a... Who, you have a tit as a paperweight? Whose tit yeah. is in my garage? So... Um, I, do you think you'd find a tit if you look in our garage since you won't go in there? Maybe. There's a lot of shit out there. I know. I got to get to work. Right so there. the next two victims... Um, hide that tit. <laughs> were, <laughs> ...were discovered within days of each other. Okay. A local fisherman found the corpse of Linda Sally in a river about 15 miles south of Corvallis. Oh, 15 miles. You know what they say about 15 miles south of Corvallis, don't you? Mm hmm Yeah, that's where you find Linda. She's 22. Also, the pl close by there, the police recovered the body of Karen Sprinkler, who was 19, and she was also a student missing since March. Karen Sprinkler? Yes. So she had been home for spring break. And this spring was break! March Woo! 27th, 1969. Oh, March 27th, 1969. She was home from spring break and was murdered the same day that on Bewitched, Samantha fools with the life of a man who refuses to donate to UNICEF. Yes. So she was going to meet her mom for lunch at the department store and shop, but she never made it out of the parking garage. Oh, she didn't make it out of the parking garage the same day that Mariah Carey was born? The two witnesses from weeks before had reported a gigantic freckled woman wandering around the parking garage fiddling with her girdle. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that giant freckled woman. Yep. That keeps messing with her girdle. So, um, you should check out that giant freckled woman over there. She had been raped before and after being strangled. <sighs> so that was an escalation. God, this, you weren't kidding when you said this was rape heavy. When her body was found, both her breasts were missing. He wanted to make some more paperweights, so, so he stuffed them with sawdust and placed them on the mantle of his house. Tit paperweights on the mantle, y'all. Look at him, giant tit paperweights. Hold on one second. Okay. I, didn't, I never thought of using a tit for a paperweight. Police questioned Karen's classmates at Oregon State University and found out that several girls had received phone calls from a man asking to meet them. He claimed to be a Vietnam veteran with psychic powers, and most of the girls <laughs> had wisely turned him down. However, maybe, maybe this is you. You feel like you were a Vietnam veteran in a former life. Maybe, maybe you're this guy. However, one student did accept his offer to meet. Uh oh. She reported that he was fat. Freckled and very odd. Fat, freckled, and very odd, y'all. He had referred to every as, lady's as, while they were dream. out. Yeah. He had referred to those two poor girls whose bodies were found in the river, and he even told her she was wise in declining his offer to give her a ride because how do you know I wouldn't take you to the river and strangle you? Wow. So it's good she got away. So he now he's getting yeah. reckless, right? This yeah. is the part yes. of the thing. He's he's done all these murders and nobody's even coming after him. Now yes. he gets reckless because he's like, so she, somebody she come had find call, me. So she had called police right when she got home after now, that. What I want to know is what does the family think about the tit paperweights on the he, mantle? He says he's a, he says it's like a, um, a, a gag gift, it's like a mold. It's not real. Oh. Like, Darcy is in some denial. Darcy got some problems. Yes. Is she still around? Yes. Yep. Are you in so touch with her? Do you have her number? I don't know. Less no. than a month later, he tried to take another woman hostage in the parking garage, but this time he would fail. 24-year-old Sharon Wood was on her way to meet her estranged husband to finalize a divorce. Sharon Wood sounds, sounds like a... She felt uh, a tap on Sharon her shoulder Box. and Thank turned you. around to see Jerry holding a gun. Uh-oh. She screamed as loud as she could, so he put his hand over her mouth, and then she bit down, and then they tussle, tussled, and then a car came, and he got scared and ran away. She bit on his hand. Mm hmm They tussled. Yep. And a car came. And he got away. So um, the next day, Brutus tried to kidnap a 15-year-old girl, but she got away and gave the same description as the woman in the parking garage. These oh, big, good. fat, freckled, redhead at this point, do you think like people have put out an APB, like they've notified the public, hey, watch out for a big, fat, freckled They probably did. Head. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes Some dressed as clothes. a moon. Yeah. He then bought a fake police uniform. <laughs> look out. We got to look out for a big, fat, freckled redhead. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I don't know. I'm sorry, poor, fat, freckled redheads that are listening. So he then bought a fake police uniform. He decided oh. he, he wasn't doing well taking them by force. Yeah, he's so, got to really get them to let their guard down. So he's, he's going to try trickery this he's time. He's not very agile. Yeah. so um, It's he, hard to be an agile, fat, freckled redhead. So he, tr he dressed like a 
security guard, police okay. officer type, and headed to the shopping center. There he found, and this is when, this is, okay, so I'm backing up a little bit. Oh, we're this going back. A backtracking. a little more about Linda Sally. Let's play the backtracking music. Backtrack. This is just some details that, about Linda Sally and her death. So he went to oh, the shopping center. Oh, she was the center. one who she, was in the oh, well, In the river. river. Yeah. Um, in the river. He told her. Throw me in the water. Shh, so, shush. Sorry. He told, he told her there had been a rash of shoplifting at the mall oh. and that she looked like the prime suspect. Oh, no. So she was in so trouble. So he told her to go with him. Oh. And on the hour drive, she got in his car. On the hour drive. For an hour he drove with her? To the which river? was not in the direction of the police station. No, it was Linda more in the Linda didn't say of the a river. word. Yeah. She just sat in the car. He drove her to his house and directed her to his garage, and he tied her up and went in to eat dinner. Wait, how do we know this if she his, died? His confession. Oh, he confessed to it. Mm -hmm. When he got back, he found she had broken free of her ropes, but she was just sitting there waiting. That doesn't sound right. Well, there's there's something called um, frozen fright. Okay. That can happen with kidnap victims. Yeah. Where you it's your it's a it's a response and yeah. you just can't do anything. Kind of like rabbits. Like when you yes. catch a rabbit, they freeze. Yeah. And you know, yeah. So um, that could be what, what yeah. was going on. That probably happens. So he strangled her and threw her in the river. Oh, man. And then, um, let's see. So, yeah, and we talked about how he was at Oregon State University and he kept hanging around campus. He would call the dorms and he would ask for like Deb or Pam or Susie, like names that that everybody had. Yeah, yeah. Deb, Pab, and Susie, everybody was named that in the 60s. That's right. Hold on. I'm... Oh, go back here. Okay. Okay. Um. So the detectives catch up with him, and they... they... Do they mustard with him, too? <laughs> All right. So Super they visit joke. him um, yeah. to, to check out what's going on because they they tracked him down from from the campus. Okay. From hanging around and stuff. Hey, just everybody call if you see a fat redheaded guy with freckles. Yes. So they visit his, him as his garage workshop. Okay. And he didn't show very much concern. He allowed them in. He answered their questions. He even let them take away one of the incriminating knots. So when the bodies were found, they had <sighs> they had this special, the knots that the rope was tied in was a, an yeah. electrician's knot. Oh, so only certain and people know how to cut that knot or tie that tie knot. Tie that knot. And then he had like a whole bunch of nylon rope in his garage, and he's like, oh, you might want some of this too? I heard that they were tied with ropes. You want some of this? And huh. like, yeah. So Like he wants to get caught. Maybe. Kind of. I don't know. Something wrong with him. Well, I'd say. This guy's got something wrong with him. Um, When they got him, when they got Not a normal him down fella. to the police. Well, then they, so they took the stuff. They went to the police station. Yeah. The crime lab immediately matched the rope and the knots. So they issued an arrest warrant. Uh-huh. And they caught him and his wife as they were driving to Canada. Oh, my gosh. He was caught on May so, 30th, 1969. Oh, you didn't give me that date. Oh, so I, I don't, don't have anything. So he, he must have... Um, he must have told her everything, right? No, he he made up some bullshit. Oh, why he had she, to go to Canada? Yeah. So at first he remained silent, but then their interrogation... You know, soon had him bragging, and they appealed to his braggadocious nature. Yeah, like, yeah, if you're a narcissist yes. with all this. Yes, and so he confessed. So then they got a search warrant, and they raided his home and garage and uncovered drawers of carefully sorted women's clothes and shoes. Really? They found that his electrician's wiring exactly matched that used to bind the corpses. They discovered a woman's breast hardened with varnish in full <sighs> view on the mantelpiece. The most damning Fresh. evidence of all was a photograph of Jan Whitney's abused body hanging from a hook in his garage. At the victim's feet was a mirror showing a reflection of the man taking the picture, and it was clearly him. Ugh. So that's like, that yeah, couldn't be here, any more this. incriminating. Yeah. It was a picture of that. In fact, all the victims had been photographed shortly after death. He had all, all those pictures. So Ugh. initially, detectives could not believe that Darcy was unaware of her husband's crimes. She was charged with accessory to murder, and they took her children away. Oh, yeah. But eventually, they, they I mean, found it, her not guilty. They did? Yeah. And they um, and they had charged her with the murder of Karen Sprinkler, uh, of abetting the murder of Karen Sprinkler, but they found her not guilty. They did. And, the, and she was reunited with her kids. Brutus himself was charged with the four murders. He pleaded insanity, but psychi psychiatric reports declared him sane, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment at Oregon State Penitentiary. 
Really? There he became a model prisoner, allowed a large measure of freedom by the guards. He, the guards loved him. Oh, don't you just love that fat, red-haired, freckled guy? He I was, just love that guy. He was given the responsibility of the upkeep of the prison's record computers, the vending machine, and the cable TV network. <laughs> why, why, okay, why are you saying the nerd voice? I, that's the voice I give him. I think oh, that's, that's what, what he sounds, sounds like. like. Okay. There were several life-threatening attacks on Brutus by fellow inmates, really? all of which he survived. And he never dec- disclosed his assailants' identities. It was like... Oh, he never told on him, huh? Yeah. He never snitched. Don't be a snitch. He remained Snitches with, get stitches. Yep. He remained with Darcy until his death of liver cancer on March 26, 2006. Wait, she stayed married to him? Yes. So, like, visit him in prison and conjugal they, visits? I don't know if they stayed married. It said he remained in love with her. So oh. I don't know if that means they oh. stayed married. So you're not sure if there were conjugal visits? No, I'm and not you, sure. So there's not any conjugal visits you could describe. Ew. <laughs> so that's the story of the shoe fetish slayer. That guy's gross. Yes, he is. Uh, I knew you would say that. Yeah, he's a gross fetish. But we know who did it. It's guy. not a mystery. At least we know who done it. Yeah. And there was only a lot of rapes. There was a lot of rapes. That was an excessive amount of grossness. It was a lot of gross. Now that guy. No, here's a question. This guy was just as disgusting and gross and shocking as, as anything else. And why isn't he more famous? Yeah, why is he not as famous know. as Jeffrey Dahmer? Because I think this happened. We're getting close to Manson. Yeah. And oh, so, Manson overshadowed yes, everything. I think that's how it always happens. Like, it seems like, like this is crazy. Oh, but that's super crazy. Right. Like, uh, like any of the like, there's different ones where I'm like, whoa, what? How did this not? How was this person not f- more? famous no. yeah. and then you kind of look at the year or, or around that time and you'll see something real big that or maybe it's just it that there's not enough it's true kind, crime it's, podcast it's kind of the farrah fawcett michael jackson phenomenon what remember when farrah fawcett died and then michael she jackson died? died like a minute later and so farrah uh, fawcett didn't get any nobody even knew she died nobody yeah i thought she was still alive nobody even cared yeah yeah that's true i remember that there was some woman i think it was like 9 11 right before 9 11 oh yeah like well, it was had, you know what it was Gary Condon, um, that senator. Remember Chandra Levy dis- or disappeared, and they found her bones, and he, no. she was having an affair with that senator Gary Condon, I don't remember and that, um, at all. that was all blowing up in the news. And then nine eleven happened, and he was probably the only person in the whole country that was happy that nine eleven happened because yeah. nobody ever talked about it again. There was that other like I remember just like a woman who was like beating her kids in a parking lot. Oh, really? She was like, yeah. And she, her name was all over the news. Maybe it wasn't 9-11. Maybe it was another crazy thing like that. I don't remember. Okay. Anyway. It was a great story. Yeah. That, um, yeah <laughs> shut up. Shut up. <laughs> anyway, maybe there's not enough true crime podcasts. That's probably why. We need to see if we can get more. Get more. Yeah. Get the word out about Jerry Brutos. The I was just looking player. at some stats, and they said there are more true crime podcast now mm-hmm. than there are grains of sand this in, not in true. every beach. This is not yeah. true. There are more... True crime podcasts, and there are molecules. Mm-hmm. But I got oh what oh oh okay. yeah, yeah got to quote your sources. I got true. You want to get in trouble here? Truecrimemag dot com. Truecrimemag dot com. Oh, no, Thecrimemag dot com. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Thecrimemag dot com. Yes, you and got I this also from, all this from yeah. And, and well, did you and listen I, to a podcast? I was just going to say that okay. I also listened to the last podcast on the left does a good two parter about last Jerry Brutus. podcast on the left and not to. Name drop here, but um, I work with a gal who taught uh, that one guy from last Henry podcast. Zabrowski. Henry Zabrowski. 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 Henry Zabrowski. She was his professor or TA or she, anyway, he was in her class. She taught Very, That's pretty cool. In college, in some college Where are you in bragging? Florida or who Texas cares? or somewhere. What's the point of this? Who cares? It's a connection. So they can't get mad at us for it's stealing true. their info because Leela Board, friend of the show, she oh, was, I don't know if she I wonder listens. if he would remember her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's in touch with him still. Like she oh, really? She talks to him, I think. That's cool. Uh, but anyway. anyway, they had a good two-parter. If you want to hear more about Jerry Brudos, I just touched, I just tickled Yeah, we the, just did a little bit of it. It just tickled the 
the edges edge of the clitoris and then they like really went full bore into the i don't know anus. why <laughs> i'm not sure how it goes. i'm wondering anyway last podcast on the left is a lot more famous and they got a lot more money and they don't have to do anything else it's true so um i'm hoping to book them for a comedy festival someday all right what's next oh that's right back to me huh January 28th, Sarah McLaughlin was born. Tuesday, January 30th, I don't know if you know about this, uh, Tuesday, January 30th, 1968, Ford's Theater mm-hmm. in D.C. Have you ever heard of it? Um, Yes, I think. When yeah. Lincoln yeah. was killed? Yeah. It held its first entertainment program since April 14th, 1865, mm-hmm. when the, uh, when the, because that's when Lincoln was killed. When the comedy Our American Cousin had been interrupted by the sassy... Well, it held its first entertainment program since April 14, 1865, when the comedy Our American Cousin had been interrupted by the assassination of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. So what's the... For the reopening, Henry Fonda, Harry Belafonte, Helen Hayes, and Andy Williams were among the performers on stage in an evening, evening of music and dancing. Wait a minute. So it was. It had been closed since yep. then. Yep, and it reopened in 1968. Oh, geez. Yeah, they closed. What did they take it for? What did they take so long? I mean, that's. Well, a, I, I think they were like fucking. The president it's got like killed there. Hundred years though. They're probably we can't fucking do a show there. Who wants to go to it? I guess. Um, I think they tear it down then or something. Also, that same day, mm-hmm. Assistant Postmaster General Richard Murphy ruled that hippies. Could continue to work for the U.S. Postal Service, but they must now have neat haircuts and get rid of their beards and sandals and wear proper attire. Well, what's the point of (laughs) letting them do anything then? I don't know. There were a lot of hippies that worked in the San Francisco post office. They're not going to want to do that. And those guys, they said the San Francisco postal workers were walking their routes barefoot with shaggy beards and hair down to their shoulders. That's pretty funny. It reminds me of in in that, um, what's that show with Ricky Gervais? Remember his postman who... Oh, yeah, Wouldn't yeah. put it in the slot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big beard. Yep. And do we want to end there? That's yeah. only January. It's only one month. I know, but January is usually long because we uh, talk about all the bullshit that doesn't have a date. Good point. Good point. Yeah. I have a lot of extra stuff, too. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for listening to American Timelines. The, yes. The greatest podcast in the world. Well, I don't well, the know gr- about that. The podcast with the greatest looking pu- what? pubes. I don't. That's not. Come on. What? No, our our pop filters are made of pubes. No, they're not. No, this is the podcast with the greatest dogs, greatest elderly dogs. Greatest podcast that talks about Mork and Mindy and murders at the same time. That's right. Okay. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Rate, review, subscribe, all that stupid shit. Or you know what? Don't. I don't care anymore. Yeah. I don't give a shit. The Nobody's world's ending. It. The world's over. I, it would be nice to, for you to do it. It really would. Okay, do it for Amy. You don't but have not for else me. To do. You don't have anything else going on right now. Come on, you're bored as hell. Just figure out how to review and subscribe. Just support us. I mean, rate That's and right. review and subscribe. That's right. Anyway, thanks. Happy birthday. And Matt Truman. Awesome. Get out of here, Chuck Berry. Happy birthday, We're Sean. So tired of hearing about the six days. This episode's over. Why are you still listening? So Turn it off. When you were all alone, no watchtower, a kiss in the sky. Well, I was barely a glimmer in my young daddy's eyes. Said the wind so tired of hearing about the six days. One more time, I said, We're so tired of hearing about the six days. Well, make me shut my mouth now. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com.